welcome to our Town Hall Forum on Bullying Prevention, which is sponsored by the Boonville School District's Bullying Advisory Committee. My name is Sarah Marriott, and I am going to provide your introductions for this evening's event. This is a forum, and it's designed as an opportunity to learn more about bullying, how to identify bullying behaviors, as well as information on strategies and prevention. Our intent is to engage the community in a discussion, as well as, as initiate activism within our community. While we acknowledge that bullying is a concern within school districts across our community, our state, and our nation, it's important for us to note, though, that it's not just isolated to school days and within the school hours. That bullying occurs throughout the year, throughout the day, and it occurs across all environments. So those are the reasons why we need to take action as a community. So this evening is structured as a moderated forum. Mr. David Wren will serve as our moderator for the evening, posing questions to the panel which are asked by audience members. Committee members have note cards available to you if you want to write down a question. So if you didn't receive a note card at the beginning of the evening when you walked in, please raise your hand and someone will be more than happy to bring a note card to you. If you would like to ask a question, just write it down in the note card and then there will be people walking around to collect those note cards from you. If you just want to again raise your hand, let them know that you're ready with your question. Um, the committee members will then provide the questions to Mr. Wren. This forum is an educational opportunity for all community members, and it's not just limited to information about the Boonville School District's policies and procedures. And we kindly ask you to not include information in your questions regarding specific students, teachers, staff members, or situations. So at the conclusion of this event, we request each of you to complete a survey, which you were also handed at the beginning of the evening. And that gives us a lot of valuable feedback to our team. Committee members will collect those questionnaire forms as you exit the auditorium this evening. And then we also have additional resources outside that you are free to take. And it has a lot of information from uh, various organizations on bullying. So now I want to welcome our panel members. Dr. Chad Rose, you can just raise your hand. He's an associate professor at the University of Missouri Columbia, and he's the developer of the Mizzou Bullying Lab. And Dr. Rose has worked with the Boonville School District for almost two years now on bullying prevention and intervention strategies. Dr. Garima Singh is a child and adolescent psychiatrist from the University of Missouri Hospital and Clinics and the Thompson Center. Ms. Amy Bledsoe is an Education Safety Coordinator with Missouri School Boards Association Center for Education Safety. Mr. Brad Wooldridge is an attorney with Wooldridge and Wooldridge Law Office in Boonville. Mr. Jeremy Colliott is a juvenile officer with the Cooper County Juvenile Office. Ms. Taylor Petras is a journalist and anchor with KMIZ Channel 17. And Ms. Megan Lane is a journalist and anchor with KRCG Channel 13. I will now turn the forum over to Mr. David Wren, who will serve as the moderator for our evening. Thank you, Dr. Marriott. I want to first commend you all. My job mainly is to uh, stay in the background to present some questions so that your questions may come to the forefront and answers from the front. I uh, did, couldn't help but remark a little bit my uh, identity with you all, possibly. I appreciate you all being out here this evening. There are several things you could have been doing except be here. I notice most, uh, I notice the dynamics most of the time when I go to a, uh, a public gathering. Everybody sits in the back, and I notice you all are kind of dispersed throughout. Maybe you're a practical bunch. You're next to the aisle. You're practical that way. But I was thinking the last time, perhaps, when I was up here as a candidate, with Louisville School Board in the late and mid 90s, um, thinking about the uh, effects and the concerns of that time. Basically, it was running there not because of great qualifications, but because of concern, necessarily, but because of concerns of the issues. And I think uh, just briefly, I mentioned that bullying is, uh, as you know, 
as I look at it from a lay person's perspective, it's not new. It's been around since the first lunch line, or the first uh, recess. Uh, but I think perhaps it's, uh, we could agree on the fact that the changes in our society have made the effects, the consequences of bullying, perhaps greater than they've ever been before. So I appreciate uh, the concern of the district, uh, people taking their time to be here this evening, and certainly of you who are being here to ask questions. So uh, with that, I will move into the first question I've been given. We have some questions already, and I'll just open this up with the uh, first and opening uh, definition of questions. The first question is for Dr. Rose, and the question is, what is the definition of bullying? Well, thanks everybody for being here. Uh, I'm really excited to, to sit here on this panel. Um, I am happily, I have happily worked for and with the Boonville School District now for about two years. Uh, before I answer that question, uh, I would like to introduce a, a few of my folks back there. Uh, I have some of the, my team members from the Mizzou Ed Bully Prevention Lab. Uh, if you're in the schools, you may see some of them. Um, and so we like to, we do provide services to school districts through, throughout Mid-Missouri. Um, to answer the question about what bullying is, uh, the typical definition of what bullying is, is there is an intent to cause physical or emotional harm. There's an imbalance of physical or emotional power or a perceived imbalance. And there, the behaviors are repeated or likely to be repeated um, over time. And so that's, tr that's traditionally how we define bullying and, and, and what encompasses bullying. Um, sometimes we interpret bullying a little differently because kids are moving in and out of roles based on time and context, and I'm sure we'll probably get into another question about that later. Um, but traditionally, when we think about bullying, the state definition, the federal definition, and uh, the, the district definition uh, includes those three components, intentionality, repetition, and imbalance. The next question is for Dr. Singh. What are the signs of bullying? The signs of bullying. Hello, good evening everyone. Signs of bullying, it's, it's a broad spectrum. It can be something a kid is coming with a bruise to a kid be emotionally harmed and is isolating themselves. It's very hard to say what exactly one child is going to present than other. I always tell my parents, anytime you see there is, there is a change in their behavior, in their actions, in their academic performance, in their activities, just ask, just look around and see. There has to be a reason why a child is acting different. Either it's school, it's home, it's community. So when we, when we talk about science, I always say any, any change from the norm. And that can be physical. If we see a bruised day, the kid who wanted to go to activities, wanted to go to school all the time, now is refusing to go to school, is waking up in the morning with any sign like stomachache, I'm not feeling good, I'm fever. That's the same kid who used to love school. So what's happening? What is different? The child who wanted to go to a football game now doesn't want to go. What's happening? What's different? A happy-go-lucky child is having a meltdown at everything, is having easy tantrums, is crying for no reason. What's happening there? So any change in any of the norm or in their daily activities, we as a parent, as a caregiver, as a provider, has to look for what's happening. And those are the signs when we talk about the lake. Thank you. Thank you. Having uh, talked about the definition of bullying and the signs, the, th the third question, Dr. Rose, what are the types? Well, when we think about uh, the types of bullying, um, there are uh, four basic types of bullying. The first one is, is physical bullying. Second is, is verbal. The third one is indirect or relational. Uh, this is where uh, students are spreading rumors or socially isolating others. Um, and what we do know about relational bullying or indirect bullying is the outcomes are just as detrimental as being physically bullied every day. Um, so uh, that's what I'll, some often consider this invisible form of bullying. Um, but it, it's really problematic. I can't imagine what it would be like to go through day-to-day uh, -day and, and be isolated. Um, and then the last one is cyberbullying, 
Uh, one other thing that I should mention is what's not bullying. Um, that's the question I get all the time is, is what isn't bullying? And the first type of, of bullying, the first type of, of aggression that isn't bullying is uh, this form of bullying that, or a form of aggression where uh, kids feel like they need to protect themselves, protect their friends or family, or protect their belongings. Um, this is called instrumental aggression. Uh, the second thing that, that some uh, misinterpret as bullying is this uh, retaliatory aggression. Uh, this aggression is, is aggression that's in the heat of the moment. So I like to, to think about it when, let's say two kids are out playing basketball, one elbows another, and then a fight breaks out. This is, this is retaliatory aggression. Um, and this is oftentimes the type of aggression that we go, get most reports uh, at school. A lot of times um, kids will come home, they will, they will have been in a fight or something will happen and it'll be misconstrued as, as bullying when in fact it was uh, retaliatory aggression. Um, and then the, the last type is jostling. Uh, jostling is pretend aggression. So aggression that is, that is mutually reinforcing from both parties um, until it's not. Um, until one kid doesn't understand the other kid's threshold and it goes a little too far. And so in schools, I encourage school, uh, school teachers and, and administrators to, to stop jostling when they see it, to stop kids even if they're just pretending to fight or play fighting. Um, those of you who have more than one kid know exactly what I'm talking about, I would guess. Um, but this is, this is this pretend aggression. But what happens is it escalates to a point to where it is no longer pretend and one uh, student gets, uh, gets upset and a fight can break out. Next question from Ms. Petrus and Ms. Lane. How has social media changed bullying? There it goes. Oh man, where to start with this one? Um, I do not imagine going through middle or high school right now with our smartphones that we have now. I, I, don't, I didn't have one all the way through high school even. Um, I thought I was pretty plugged in with my friends just being able to text them all day. Uh, but now they have all these apps where you know where everyone is 24-7, what they're doing, who they're with, things like that. Um, I think social media, it, it's just another platform for bullying too. I feel like I, you can say a lot more on there that you might not say to someone in person because um, you're hiding behind a screen or a phone, things like that. I, I really cannot honestly imagine how plugged in students are now. Um, so I think it's just really given another platform for bullying for that. I think we've also seen that bullying now can be 24-7 with social media um, because you leave school and for many of us that's when the bullying would end. You could wait the whole weekend and brief group and then go there on Monday and start again, but now it's every day, every minute, your kids have your phones. Whether or not they have their phone, the bully probably has theirs, and so they're sending messages so they'll come to them. Um, so, and not only just with bullies, with social media in general, we've seen that it's hard for people, people don't post their negative things in their lives usually. They post about how great their dinner is, or how great their friends are, or this gift or that gift. So then it's internalized for another person that they're not good enough, and then people can start picking on that person based off of that. Thank you. For Dr. Singh and Dr. Rose, do boys or girls bully more? It's, it depends on what type of bullying we are talking about. As Dr. Rose said, there are four types of bullying, so when we talk about physical bullying, we see boys more than girls. And as we think about it, it makes sense. They are strong, they are, the boys want to show they are strong, they are physical, and then we see both more boys being involved in physical bullying. When we talk about girls, we see more social and relational bullying there as compared to boys. Even with verbal, we see more girls being involved than boys. Cyberbullying is kind of which is a different platform. It's more so coming from 2000. We are seeing more and more incidents and prevalence of cyberbullying in the last 20 years. 
And we see it's kind of more or less, depending on what we are talking about, that we see both our boys and girls being involved in cyberbullying. And as our other experts were saying, it's anonymous, it's a bigger audience. You go ahead and post something on Facebook or Instagram and you have an audience of thousands and millions. It's present 24 seven. You don't have to be in school or you don't have to be on a playground or a, or a basketball game to bully someone. It's right there in front of you. You don't have to come in front of anyone and it's it's 24 seven. So it's, cyberbullying is something which we are seeing more with both our boys and girls, but if uh, we see in literature and what's happening, we see physical uh, bullying more with our boys and social and relational more with our girls. I agree. Um, one, thing, uh, one thing I do want to mention, and, and the reason why uh, my team and I continue to come and do community forums is because we believe that, that bullying is, is in fact a community issue. And so something that was brought up is that you know kids are exposed to bullying now more than ever because of because of access to technology. Um, so now bullying doesn't begin and end with school bells. I mean, bullying kids are exposed to to bullying um, in all facets of their life, and it it has now become a community issue. It's become an issue that that we are all invested in, and and that's why we continue to to talk to communities. Um, to continue to send out a, a similar message that we would send to kids uh, because all of us together as a collective are, are how we're going to resolve this issue. I have a question from the, uh, tonight's crowd. Uh, I guess I'll call it a toss-up who feels that they should answer it. Are there indicators parents should be aware of in identifying or predicting bully behaviors? Well, there. I mean, this goes back uh, to some of the some of the information that was that was presented earlier. But if you see behavioral changes in in your in your kids, um, those are those are sure warning signs. So, um, but also uh, there's there's what I call uh, what we like to call the homophily hypothesis: uh, birds of a feather flock together. So, uh, one of the indicators is if you look at the friends. Um, that your son or daughter hangs with, uh, it's likely that they're engaging in the same or similar behaviors. It is unlikely that you have a kid who is the, the voice of reason in that group. I know that, I mean, I'm a parent myself, um, and I would like to think that my daughter does all the right things, um, but I mean, you know, she's still a kid. And I, I see, uh, typically when I see groups of students, they're all engaging in similar behaviors. Uh, bullying is really perpetuated by group dynamics. So when we have kids engaging in, in, uh, in bullying behaviors, they usually hang with other kids who engage in aggressive types of behaviors. Uh, some of the other indicators that you can see for kids who are engaging in bullying, those, those who we would consider perpetrators, um, are if they're, if they're also engaging in risky or delinquent behaviors, um, if they're getting in trouble at school, uh, if they are uh, talking um, back a little bit more at home, uh, they're responding to you differently, you've seen behavioral or mood changes, um, all of these things are, are signs uh, for you to start, to start to have conversations with your kids. Um, and, and this may come up later, but one of the things that, that I do, my daughter is seven, by the way, um, because I will probably refer to her throughout the, the night. Um, one of the things that, that I've learned along the way uh, is if she gets in my truck and I pick her up from school and I say, hey, how was school? She'll say, fine. I mean, she's, she says, fine. But what I do is I ask her specific questions. What made you laugh today? Who did you play with today? What did you play? Who decided what you played? And all of these probing questions get to, uh, get to the answers that I want to assess who she's hanging with, what they're doing, and how they're responding. Um, so, not only do you watch for behavioral changes, you also watch who uh, your son or daughter is, is associating with, but also ask them probing questions about what they're doing. Next question from Mr. Woolridge. Are there laws on bullying? Okay. Um, 
So I had to do a little more homework on this because, yes, there are laws on bullying, but there are different styles of laws on bullying. Uh, there are statutes on the Missouri books under education and libraries that regulates or mandates how school systems and school districts within the state of Missouri are to respond to bullying issues and how to set up school district mandates or regulations to report. Um, it looks like the last one that went through in August of 2016 is where they actually defined on the books what bullying is in the state of Missouri and what cyberbullying is in the state of Missouri to allow school districts within the state to set some form of process or protocol to address what is or is not um, required by law for schools. Now on the other hand, there are acts within the criminal statutes that could be construed as the same exact behavior. Um, it, it, within the definition of bullying under the educational statute, they, they talk a lot about harassment and stalking behaviors. Under the criminal statute, we have two separate degrees of harassment. We have degrees of stalking. I think that, uh, based on my last conversation with Dr. Rosen, I think it's a consensus now that there is an effort to at least minimize the, the push towards criminalizing bullying through adolescent behavior. The important thing is that we, whoever's doing the bullying, are perhaps struggling with their own issues. Perhaps they've been bullied somewhere, somewhere else. So as educators, as um, juvenile officers, as attorneys that may help with families with this, let's try to define what issues we're dealing with that um, we can kind of steer these kids that are demonstrating bullying behavior away from that because if they don't watch it, they're going to veer directly into violation of criminal statutes. And, and I think that comes back to an education system not the educational system of school districts, but making sure our parents understand the importance of, if, you, if your kid's demonstrating bullying behavior, hey, if you don't watch it, you're gonna find yourself turning 17 or 18 and then being looking at, at criminal prosecution. And I think Jeremy could probably expand on this a little bit, the struggles that we deal with from application of the laws of the state as they relate to criminal behavior to what he may see at a juvenile level, which is bullying behavior, but within a few years that becomes a slippery slope, if you will, for uh, criminal prosecution. And Brad is right. In the juvenile court, we actually charge kids with adult crimes, um, but uh, generally we try to uh, handle the situation on, on an informal basis so that we don't criminalize the kids, but we still give them consequences. We still try to get them help for, for particularly whatever they're doing. Um, but the main thing with kids is uh, we have to take into account everything to do with that child before we decide how we're going to handle the situation. Um, you know, we have to take in mental health concerns, family concerns, um, community concerns, school concerns. Um, it's not like the adult system. You steal, this is what you get. Uh, with kids, it doesn't work that way. We have to take everything into account that has to do with that child and then try to come up with a plan that best suits that particular child and what they're doing. So. Staying with Mr. Woolrich and Mr. Collier, as a parent, can I go talk to the parents of a student accused of bullying my child? Uh, Jeremy and I actually, we, we kind of delved into this before. Uh, so 20 years ago, that was commonplace. And when I read, uh, when I thought about that question, um, there's nothing illegal about it. Um, the question is when it becomes inappropriate. Uh, I think as a safeguard, it a lot boils down to who the parent is, if it's someone that you have some kind of common relationship with or not. But again, I referenced it in the last question, there's a slippery slope there. I think that we need to establish, and perhaps that's part of the reason we're here tonight, what protocols do we need to have in place in this community to address those issues? So instead of going around the corner and knocking on the door of the parent of the kid that may be exhibiting bullying behavior, do I need to make a reference to a school faculty official, to a law enforcement official, to a juvenile officer? Where do I start this so that, and talk about the six prior, where do I start that procedure so that if we see this repetitive bullying behavior, someone can act on it, as opposed to 
hey, your kid was pushing my kid in school and has been doing that. I don't think that solves the problem. In my perspective, it's just a personal one, and I have no problem if you're going to go talk to the parent. Um, I think if you do decide to do that, um, that as soon as or if it at all becomes confrontational, that you should, of course, leave and uh, contact the school or contact the juvenile office. Um, I do have quite a few parents that call me, and I'll mediate between the two parents uh, just so that they can solve the problem and that law enforcement doesn't have to get involved. But I personally have no problem talking to other parents, um, but if it does become confrontational, I would suggest you leave immediately and contact the school or, or law enforcement to take care of it for you. Well, Ms. Bledsoe <clears throat> and Ms. Talia, Mr. Collier, excuse me, what can I do if I witness a bullying incident? Again, I think this goes back to what you're comfortable with. Um, um, I, I have no problem intervening on something like that. If you, if you see a bullying incident, uh, I think the main thing would be for you to maybe re try to remove the victim from the situation, uh, not necessarily confront the other child, because uh, that could turn into a whole other mess. So if you are going to uh, intervene, I would say intervene by removing the victim of the situation, and then, of course, depending on where it is, either contact school officials or uh, local law enforcement to report. I agree with what Jeremy said. Um, in addition, you would want to tell somebody. Well, you did say that. <laughs> uh, it's, it's always best to keep everybody safe or make them as safe as soon as possible and then make sure that they're okay and go talk to somebody so that we can get it stopped. There's a question from the audience. <clears throat> Are there programs or is there research for educating parents of pre-K kids? This is, uh, this is a, a tough one. Um, the reason why is because there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of uh, programs that are driven toward parent education that has a strong research back, meaning that um, there hasn't been a lot of programs that have been developed to where they have, they have assessed whether or not parents have, have gained the knowledge and also have a different or changed perception of, of bullying. Um, there are several programs that are available, um, you know, but one thing, one thing that, I'm, that, that I caution a lot of folks on is, um, is the expertise of folks that, that create some of these programs uh, because there, there are a lot of people that, are, that personally try to make a buck on, on the fears of, of us um, parents and teachers and educators um, in bully prevention. Uh, you'll never hear me call myself an expert in bullying. Um, those of you who know me know that I've never said that about myself because I continue to learn. Um, and I think it's the same with it's the same with programs. Uh, we have to be cautious about adopting programs uh, that um, are preying on our fears and uh, telling us to do the right things or telling us to do the wrong things because sometimes they can perpetuate the problem. Um, sometimes uh, these. Sometimes the, the programs aren't designed to meet the needs of the individual who has pur purchased them. Uh, so with that said, there are some approaches like social emotional learning approaches that have been very effective, meaning that when you, when you work with your kids, especially even at, at the pre-K level, when you start to work with your kids on social awareness and responsible decision making and self-management, uh, self-awareness and social awareness, those types of things, those are important for you to start to foster in, in, your, young, in your young kids, in, in all kids, but especially young kids, because then they start to learn the critical, critical social and communication skills. But if I, wanted to, if I wanted to educate parents on how to start working with their kids to avoid bullying when they get to school, one thing that I would encourage them to do is start working on social and communication skills. Social communication skills are two of the biggest predictors of bullying involvement um, in, in all of our research. Uh, we have been able to identify those two critical areas 
And when it comes to research and the, and the research and programs that we put in place, we don't typically put in place bully prevention programs per se. We put in programs that, that support kids' social and communication skill development because that provides them with lifelong skills and it provides them with, um, with skills to be able to respond appropriately to their peers and also assess social, situation and social situations in an appropriate way. In addition to my role with the Center for Education and Safety, I am also a school board member and a licensed professional counselor. And my best and most important role is mother of four kids, ages 23, 19, 16, and 14. So a little bit of background. All of the different trainings that I have gone to as a licensed professional counselor uh, on bullying, it all comes down to, to what Dr. Rose said. Uh, many of us remember the golden rule, okay? That, that can go a long way. We need to treat others as we want to be treated. So that, that can help as early as pre-K. Next question, perhaps touched on it a little bit, or maybe further explore Ms. Petrus and Ms. Lane. What if I see or witness something in public? Should I intervene? Your thoughts? I think um, as somebody, my brother was severely bullied all through high school, well, elementary through high school. Um, and on a personal level, I wish somebody would have stepped in at his age and said, hey, that's not cool. Like, why do you want somebody to hurt? Why do you get satisfaction or laugh at somebody in pain? Um, my brother has a tick, a facial tick, um, and he is a bigger guy. But it's things that he couldn't help at that time. So as on a personal level, yes, I think you should intervene. Um, we have a, a station initiative, it's called Stop Bullying Mid-Mo at the, our station. And through talking to different counselors, when a child thinks it's safe, yes, intervene just to say, hey, like, let's leave this kid alone. As an adult, yes, you should intervene. Um, if you need to call authorities, call them. If there's um, some form of violence going on, if there's a threat. I don't want to go to school, somebody is hurting my feeling. So first of all, always thank your child, validate their feeling. When parents try to brush it off, I think that's the toughest thing for a kid. When mommy and daddy are not going to support me, there is nobody who's going to listen to me. And it, that doesn't have to be mommy and daddy, it can be any trusted adult. So first of all, thank your child, validate the feelings of the child. And then the most important thing, get to the facts. What happened? Where did it happen? How did it happen? What, what, what did you do? If possible, write it down, document it. Then go next, next to the authority figure. Is it school? Is it a coach? Is it an activity? And then next make a formal and address that situation in that setting. Then if it's school, go to the school, get a meeting set up, ask the principal, what's the policy? What's going to be the plan? And make sure you have documentation and you are writing it up as we move in the hierarchy so that we get to the point where we need to do what needs to be done. Thank you. So uh, one message that I, can send, that I consistently send to the students with which I work is that you don't have the right to make others feel bad about themselves. Just like people don't have the right to make you feel bad about yourself. And so if you're concerned that your uh, son or daughter is engaging in bullying behavior or aggressive behavior, um, just communicate with them, talk to them, and then also assess their behaviors as, as we've mentioned earlier. But one of the messages that you should consistently send, even if you hear them making fun of somebody um, in a way that, that may not be construed as bullying, but it's, it's certainly probably not appropriate, um, the, the message that, that you should be sending is they don't have the right to make others feel bad about themselves. Um, and if we continue to send that message, they'll understand. In, nowhere in that message am I saying that all kids have to be friends. That's not a message that I'm sending. The message that, that I'm sending to kids is that they don't have the right to make, make each other feel bad.
bullying happens for about three quarters of the movie. Then all of a sudden this kid who is being victimized stands up, becomes popular and attractive and strong and, and he, he or she is, is the victor, right? And I mean, that's the messages that we're sending kids and that's what they're consuming, but that's not reality. Um, but the reality of the situation is there are a lot of school districts and a lot of schools and a lot of people and a lot of families that are doing something to stand up against bullying. And just like we're doing here today, um, you know, this is, this is a step in the right direction to start talking about positive things and start putting positive things out in the news or in social media because we have to change the narrative. Because if we get positive things out there and show kids what they can do and how they can make an impact, we can condition them to do the right things. We can condition them to, to start engaging in, in socially appropriate behavior. We can condition them to, to do what we would expect them to do and no longer, no longer push this narrative of it gets better. Because what if it doesn't? You know, I never tell a kid, there, there's never a time where I sit down and tell a kid that it, that it gets better. What I tell them is, I'm going to help it get better. I'm here right beside you. And some of you probably have kids in this auditorium that I've had the opportunity to work with or my team have, and we all send the same message because we're trying to condition kids to do the right things, and we're also trying to change that narrative because kids are exposed to the negative. Kids know bullying is bad. We don't have to walk into a school and tell kids bullying is bad. We don't have to, we don't have to tell kids don't bully. They know that. They know that. But what we do, but we, what we can do is show them what we're doing as adults to push the positive narrative forward and stop exposing kids to some of these negative things that they're experiencing in pop culture, in the media, and in the social media. You can work on uh, the solution. Am I allowed to ask a question? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, going back to the social media, you said you have a lot of reports that are starting there. Does that make your job more difficult? Because a lot of those things they can be anonymous, they disappear like that. I mean, how does I mean, that complicate things? Actually, it doesn't. Okay. Once we get the report, the kids, they have to get it. it it's out there, um, you know, whether it's a Snapchat group or, or just uh, actual texting back and forth or some kind of uh, Facebook, Facebook messenger or whatever. Um, it's actually not complicated because the majority of people who report it are taking snap, uh, screenshots of it or, or printing it off or doing whatever to bring it into us. So social media is actually made it easier to, to, deal, to learn about it and deal with it, but it's made the, it a lot worse than I think somebody mentioned earlier because it's not done when the school day is over. It goes all night long, all weekend long, um, and uh, I, I think that also correlates to all the calls I'm getting a potential suicidal child. It's because social media, they're, they're bombarded all day, all night, uh, they don't get so it's it's made it easier, but it's also made things way more difficult in, in the situation. So, and I just I want to build on what Jeremy just said, and I, I think you all refer to it as is it relational or indirect uh, bullying. One, um, the, the advent of social media has made the legal world much more easier because I mean that's Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter. I mean those that is one of the best evidentiary tools now used by law enforcement and in the legal world because there's a history of it. Um, but the, the, the negative effect is bullying never stops because, um, you know, it, someone mentioned earlier, it's so easy when you're behind the screen, you've got this, you know, there's a false sense of security to the bully because they can write or type whatever it is they want. And perhaps that's why we're here tonight. Perhaps that's why we see um, this exponential growth in bullying because it was limited to the to the basketball court or to the locker room or to the skating rink. And I was making a comment earlier, I used to love to go to the ballpark when I was a kid here in Boonville and there were some bullies coming and going, but love to go to the ballpark. I heard a parent say the other night, why would you let your kid go to the ballpark? You know, and I'm like, I couldn't imagine not letting my kid go to the ballpark. But then I, it's hard to put your head around the fact that if there's an incident at the ballpark, then it's going straight on to social media, and then it just never, ever stops. So I uh, back to the question, ask your kid, where do you feel safe, or where do you feel uncomfortable? Is it the skating rink? Is it um, the after-school program? Or not? So. Question? 
question for Dr. Singh uh, to touch on what you mentioned prior earlier about boys and girls, the difference. Perhaps uh, boys tend to be situational a bit, and girls and uh, relational. Do boys and girls bully differently? Yes, as I said before, with boys we see more physical kind of bullying, so it's more hitting, pushing, kicking, and girls it's more relational, so spreading rumors, uh, making false allegations, having friends against them, and more relational and social is what we see with girls, and it's more physical when we see with, with boys. But with the new cyber thing, it's a whole different story and a whole different world. So there, we still are very vague about the incidence and prevalence, if it's more girls or more boys. But even in when we come to social media, the comments which are by boys are more direct, whereas by girls, it's more relational, it's more rumors, it's more like making stories about it, she's dating this one, this is this, like more getting into those kind of things. And girls feel that the cyber and the social impacts their social and emotional life more than the physical. So, yes. Thank you. So, Ms. Bledsoe and Ms. Kaliot, how do we report bullying if it happens on the bus? Again, as in, in all the roles, all the different hats I wear, I will tell you that when you're involved in a school activity, school property, transportation, it needs to be reported to the school. So if you can report it to the bus driver, but it eventually needs to go to the building principal, um, again, it's all about telling a trusted adult. Uh, I agree. Um, it, unfortunately, a lot of times, um, you know, the kid will get off the bus and go home and tell the parents, uh, the parents will call law enforcement before schools have an opportunity to address it. Um, and it does happen when you first contact schools. First, I would definitely notify the uh, school district. Um, uh, we notify law enforcement just to know we're going to call the school and we're going to communicate with the school and work with them and give them the opportunity to solve the problem before we get involved. To Mr. Woolwich, Mr. Colliott, and Dr. Rose, how can I help if my child is a perpetrator? Um, I think we kind of hit on this a little bit earlier. Um, not only communication with your child, and you may have to determine whether or not your uh, child needs some kind of counseling. Um, I will tell you that uh, our local law enforcement and juvenile office, if you ever want us to have a conversation with your child, um, we'd be more than happy to do that. Uh, a lot of people think that if, if someone does come and talk to us, that they have a record or something like that. But we handle a lot of things informally, or I just go and talk to a child. Record of it, um, you know, just to talk to them about their behaviors and what those could be. Um, so I would say talk to your child, uh, potentially counseling if necessary. And if you do want the assistance of law enforcement to talk to you, by all means call us and we'll have to go It also depends on the age. Um, so I'm going to work with. I'm, I'm going to work with uh, with a younger kid in elementary differently than I would uh, a student who's in high school. Uh, for example, um, when a kid is in elementary, we can do, uh, as parents, we can do some empathy training. We can talk to them about situations. Uh, kids that are, like, especially like kindergartners, first, second graders, they're really egocentric. So they're, they're thinking about self a lot. And so you can start to see some of these bullying kinds of behaviors happen because they are so entrenched in self. Um, and that that's a perfect time for you to start talking about empathy and start talking about, um, you know, wearing someone else's shoes and all of these different things that, that you can teach them at a young age. Now, when they get older, we're, we're going to be working with them completely differently. 
we're going to be talking to them about consequences consequences to actions. We'll be talking to them about um, issues related to future and how they're responding. Um, we'll be talking to them about, about true outcomes, what these outcomes actually are. Um, because older kids are, are certainly aware of, or at least have the ability to kind of look ahead in the future. And so you can start talking to them about the way that they are responding and acting yeah. is going to have direct impacts on their future. I mean, I started thinking, you know, I, I was an athlete in, in high school and college, and I, I think about it very similarly. I knew that some of some of my actions in high school could have impacted my my ability to go play college sports. Um, it, it's the same with behavior. When we talk to kids, uh, older kids, they understand that some things they do can have a direct impact on their future. And so, um, when I work with with late middle, early high or late middle high school students. Um, you know, we have candid and honest conversations about the behaviors in which they're engaging in and the outcomes, the future outcomes that can result. Mr. Kali and Dr. Rose, there's really not much I can add to that. I mean, you touched on it. I think age plays a big part. Um, I think the difference between um, educational and consequential um, effects of, of potential bullying behavior in, in your child. But then I also go back to, to what Jeremy touched on, which is communication. And it's, that's always the strongest point for me. Related question, what is the, I think you may have touched on it, but maybe the specific timeline. What is the timeline for a response from the school following a report of bullying? And what can I expect from the school? I believe the, the Boonville School District's policy is uh, 10 days to include the investigation of the bullying um, so their policy, I'm not sure exactly what it is on reporting to the person that reported. Um, from, from our perspective, the juvenile office and law enforcement is, uh, there is no time frame um, for us to uh, notify a victim of what the outcome of the case is. Uh, and also we throw in the fact that most juvenile uh, information is sealed, so we can't give out a lot of information. I do know with the school district, they have 10 days per their policy to include an investigation into a bullying incident. Um, and I don't believe there's an actual set guideline on them to report to us. Oh, no. Uh, so I don't believe there's a, within 20 days, they have to report it to law enforcement. It's at their discretion if they believe that it needs to be, law enforcement needs to be included. Um, they call it. The Google School District is very good at communicating with law enforcement. Uh, with me, uh, I generally talk to at least one of the administrators in the district daily. Um, so uh, they are very good about including law enforcement when they deem it necessary. So bullying, bullying that is at the school, um, that ten day, the ten day timeline is accurate based on state law. Um, so the way the process looks is, um, if a if a teacher is made aware or should reasonably be aware of a bullying incident, they have two days to file. A formal report, so two school days, um, and then so that it also includes if um, if a report is made by my parents. So when parents make a report, a formal report is is initiated. It goes then to the principal or delegate. Um, that individual, generally the principal, has two school days to initiate the investigation. That investigation then has has ten school days to begin. And, and but there's no beyond if it has if the bullying isn't isn't within the context of the school. There's no set timeline outside of that that I'm aware. Of. This next question is from the audience. I think you may have touched on it a little bit while it was in transit, but I want to make sure since it's from the audience that it's read. What is the school's role when bullying happens at the skating rink or the ballpark? and it spills over to the school. Well, there's a difference of opinion on that, but um, if something happens outside of school, but the kids bring it into school and it affects the school environment, school has a right to give those kids consequences for their actions at school. So if I have a fight at the skating rink, but they come to school and they're still mouthing each other, they're you know, spreading rumors, the school does have a right to 
provide consequences to those kids for what they're doing in school, which is disrupting the environment. Um, so potentially, a kid can uh, you know, get in trouble for the fight in my office, but also get consequences at school for what they do the next day or the days after that. Uh, we have that a lot when the stuff starts on social media in the evening, on the weekends, and then the kids bring it to school. Um, so all of the threats may have been made on Saturday, Sunday, but they're still talking. Monday, so they end up getting uh, some type of uh, consequence in school. So if they bring the problems that happened outside of school to school, they're going to get consequences from the school also. Very good, thank you. <clears throat> I will mention that uh, we mentioned the meeting would be from 6 to 7.30, and I have about 7.15, so we'll be, uh, we're not quitting yet, but we'll be, we're heading that way. I'll leave a few minutes for Dr. Marriott to uh, finish up. Uh, so if you have any questions, it's my chance to give you the 10 minute warning. If you have any questions, please please uh, make sure that uh, Jesse or whoever has these to bring them up. Uh, another one from the audience, are you finding more parents getting involved in bullying, i.e. encouraging or directly responding on texts, et cetera? I'm not sure how to use that. I do have quite a few uh, where kids are getting into it and a parent um, gets on and tries to stop it. Um, I have had a few where the parent is also very inappropriate um, to the other child. Um, but the majority uh, of the time, the, the parent's not involved in the actual interaction between the two kids. But I've made a word. I'm sure if a parent says something inappropriate, they're not going to bring it to me. So, uh, so it does happen. But I don't see a whole lot. The majority of what I get is between the kids. I brought that information out So, I, I mean, we're not getting a lot of reports when we assess kids about their their parents being involved either. Um, but I would like to make a plug here when we talk about parent involvement. Um, I'd love for parents to get more involved on a, on a positive end. Uh, I would, like I said earlier, I would love to change the narrative around this and start talking about what we're doing to move our kids in a positive direction. And if I start getting reports like that, that'd be fantastic. This is addressed to all. <clears throat> what kind of behavioral interventions and supports can I engage in with my child to show them more appropriate ways to behave? said before, as a parent, we can be the biggest role model, model the behavior which we want our kids to do. When we see something wrong happening, we need to intervene and say stop. If we are going to stand inside, inside and just witness it, I think our kids are going to learn from that. So teaching our kids to be kind, to, to say no when things are not happening right, by making sure they and the people around them are safe. When it comes to cyberbullying, I always tell my parents and colleagues around to be careful with what gadgets are we giving to our kids. This Christmas, I work at Thompson Center, as we said, I work with developmental disabled kids and kids with autism, and they are always more likely to be bullied in school than our typical growing kids. And uh, two weeks before Christmas, I started asking every kid, what do you want for Christmas? What do you want Santa to bring you? 90% of my kids from age 6 to 18 said phone, tablet, laptop, or video games. So there are pros and cons of gadgets and technology we are giving our kids to, but we have to make sure we are giving in the same hands. Make sure your desktops, your laptops are in a I see so many times kids are just on their phone looking at it and half of the time I ask them what are they watching, they are like something on YouTube. We need to know what that something is, what our kids are watching, what they are looking for. Have parental control on your cable, your internet, know your network provider. When your child is having accounts on Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, 
What's their account? What's their ID? Whom they are chatting with? What does their Facebook account looks like? What privacy information is there? Are they putting their address and phone number there? How, how much susceptible are they to be victimized? So just educating our kids, educating our community, so they are making a healthy and a good decision. It's different when they are little, when they are five and six, where we need to be more protective, and it's different when they are adolescent. Teenage kids and parents don't get along very well most of the time. So we need to build that trust that they can they can come and say, hey mommy, hey daddy, this is not going right, or something is bugging me, or this is happening. We need to have that relationship with our kids. Thank you. If I can expand on that just for a second, I think we, we started the night talking about empathy and empathy training, um, and what else we can do, but. Uh, I was happy to hear um, a reference to the golden rule, like treat other people as you want to be treated. But it, the irony of that is I literally was visiting with my three-year-old daughter about the golden rule last night. So I was happy to hear that come full circle because I don't think that it's ever too early to start talking about that. And then the reference to tablets and phones, we regulate the amount of um, on-air or online time you can have. And she's three, you know. But we want to make sure that, that she understands that you know, we can be kind to one another, but there, there are rules and there are consequences, and, and we kind of watch what she's exposed to and encourage that. But it, so it, interaction and, and, um, and empathy, and ultimately that can lead to consequences. But I think you start with, with the communication. So I think um, some of there's when we talk about behaviors, uh, I we should understand that behavior is functional and communicative. When kids engage in behaviors, whether they're, they're positive or not so positive, they have been reinforced to do so. And typically we are the ones that reinforce those behaviors. Uh, in my house, we live by three basic rules that uh, I learned from my college football coach and my daughter, who's, like I said, she's seven, she can recite these to you. Um, it's do the right things, give your best effort and have class. And so one of the things that I try to do in my life is model those. So anytime, if my daughter was to walk into here, in here, she would see me doing those three things. If she caught me out anywhere in the community, I'm doing those three things. And I model the behaviors that I want my daughter to engage in. And I think that that's something, um, that's something that we, we all can do. I mean, you know, we, we, talk about, we talk about social and communication skills. We are the social and communication skill model for our kids. And so I will, you know, have class, do the right things, and give my best effort in, in everything I do, just as I hope that my daughter does. I think, oh, can I go? Please. I'm just going to piggyback after Dr. Doc was saying, um, parents can educate themselves too. We come across so many anonymous apps, new ones constantly that we're talking to our cybersecurity uh, detectives about in Boone County of these new ones that pop up all the time. I think just a simple Google search of what's the hot anonymous app right now can, and seeing if your child is on that because that's those are another tricky one too because they people can post anonymously and you have no idea who is on the other end posting that. I think just also educating yourself and if your child has that, what they're doing on it again those anonymous apps, their new ones are popping up all the time. We can't even keep up with them. If I can add just briefly, one of the things that uh, we've certainly learned from the FBI is anytime you have a device, and of course now the cameras are all right there. If you buy a laptop, you don't have to buy the extra camera. It's right there. And we need to be aware that sometimes people can turn those on from elsewhere. So simple, simple. We all do it at our house. People walk into my office and laugh at me. Post-it note over that um, camera eye because you never know. Okay, and um, also along with um, reporting things, the Missouri School Violence Hotline, we've got a lot of their materials out there, magnets and whatnot, and please take those with you. Um, they also have an app to report it. So you can report anonymously or you can report um, and state who you are. We'll finish with the last question I had from the audience. Um, for, for Jeremy and Bray, what additional resources are needed and how can the community help provide them? 
So I'd, I'd like to think that tonight's an example of what what, what that what we can do. Uh, we, we need to open the lines of communication and, and start addressing this. Uh, I love the fact that there is an open line of communication between school, faculty, and administration, law enforcement, juvenile division, and opening uh, opening arms and invitation to parents and concerned citizens in the community. I think that's the first thing that we can do. Uh, we know that the school administration, in fact, they have certain guidelines that they have to follow, follow as far as reporting procedures before it ends up with juvenile division or law enforcement or in any legal terms. But, and, and I was saying this before the forum tonight, it starts with meetings like this, panels like this, communication like this. Uh, last summer we had the anti-bullying little fun, hey, it was a, you know, just a meet and greet. And we had parents and faculty interacting with one another, handing out bottles of water and candy and bringing the kids down so that parents feel comfortable reporting incidences or concerns to school faculty or to other individuals in the community. So I, I hate to sound so, so simple with the answer, but this is where it starts. And then this will open the door to what's, what do we do next? What, what, how do we build on this? Because I know that there will be questions between Jeremy and I or the school administrators and law enforcement and, and Dr. Rose and say, okay, you're coming back over. How can we continue to build? Can we start another uh, another workshop or something else? Like this is this is where it starts. Right here. I would have to agree. In our community, the school is uh, the only entity at this point that's that is addressing the need. Um, law enforcement is a reactive institution. Uh, you know, we cannot do something until it happens. Uh, the school district. I can go, yep, he's going to be in trouble, I'll just lock him up now, but we can't do that. Um, unfortunately, we have to wait until something happens. So, parents need to get on board with the school district, uh, who is doing everything they can to address bullying, to educate on bullying, and I think if that happens, we will definitely see a change in the atmosphere here. Very good. <coughs> I'd like to thank three groups of people tonight. Certainly, I want to thank each member of our panel. Uh, very evident that they are boots on the ground, so to speak, uh, from practical experience for being proactive in the advisory committee for having it. Thirdly, and actually primarily, I want to thank you uh, for showing up. The uh, uh, As a parent, I tell you that my uh, success uh, uh, formula was 90% of success is showing up, and that's what you've done this evening. Now, the other 10%, I'm leaving that all up to you. I don't know the answer to that, but thank you for showing up. Thank you, David. If we could just give our panel and uh, Mr. David Wren a round of applause. Thank you. A couple more just key points in regards to a little bit more information about Google School District specifically. If you witness bullying, if your student um, is a victim of bullying or is a perpetrator, there are ways for you to report that information to our staff, which is very important. Um, what I often see as an administrator, um, and no fault of anyone, is the parents or community members or concerned citizens will, will bring something to our, our attention that we had no idea about. So the first step is making those important people aware that need to be made aware of what's going on. And you can do that a, a couple of different ways at Moonville. You can go on our website. There's a